the tape has to run. They're putting all this on, on cable. So. Oh, well, no, it, on, on a replay. I don't know when they'll be playing it. It's called tape? Okay. <laughs> One press. <laughs> It is weird, isn't it? <laughs> That's weird, huh? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Made me self conscious. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> hmm? Once it was named, it was out of the bag. <laughs> We're ready to start now. <laughs> Hi, my name is John Mincheski, and I'm your poet this evening. At Southdale Library. I'm going to be reading mostly all new stuff, poems that I've never read before. I'm going to be reading a few older ones, uh, and one from my second book, The Reconstruction of Light. And my friend and collaborator and accompanist, Kerry Thomas, is with me tonight, and he'll be sitting in on that poem. Actually, it doesn't look like I have many poems here. I, I have some more there, but I'm going to be trying out something brand new on you tonight, too. So it's totally new, never, well, some of you have heard earlier drafts of it, but this is, it's brand new. I want to start out, though, with poetry and not a lot of talk. This one is called Swallow Tail. It's for the butterfly. The butterfly was black. It didn't seem to mind the power more I left idling to watch it climb flocks the purple, long-stemmed ones that in June look like they'll die. Black with bright stripes on its twin tail, like combat ribbons on certain generals who have been everywhere for the sake of war. Like cities that can be seen from outer space. The toll road along the edge of Lake Michigan, east through South Bend, Mishawaka, Elkhart. A road like any other, except I remember traveling it, a great slingshot to New York, the ocean, Paris. I find the lists of certain names painful, and I slip into another language. Yes, August has settled again. This butterfly on the squared off, four-bladed propellers of the flocks collecting the night scent of these flowers that were said by the Greeks to resemble tongues of flame. Wings moving deceptively fast, giving that floating sensation. I never knew what work to keep an even keel and stay drunk on this vast voyage to Honduras. The next poem is called Phelps Municipal Dump. It's a small community of Phelps, Wisconsin, in northern Wisconsin, uh, near a place called Long Lake. And my friend Pierre Delatro, who will be reading next week in this program, in this very spot, on this very stage, uh, his Finnish grandfather had his farmstead on that lake. And I was visiting there summer before last with Barbara and Alvaro and Joan, my wife and friends. And uh, it was a wonderful spot. But as we had to leave, we had to, Alvaro and I had to take the garbage to the dump. So this is dedicated to Alvaro Cardona Hein, <laughs> Phelps Municipal Dump. It is a day between rains, and the municipal dump is closed. We haul our garbage on foot up from the main gate. The black top curves past the white fridges and stoves to an old man in a pit tending small clumps of fire. 
He motions broadly, toss it anywhere. He's used to pines whose color seeps out over a rusty caterpillar tractor. Our cardboard box tumbles and spills beneath the jowls of Lake Superior into the center of the continent. On the right side of the road, these rosy clusters of smoke become raspberries, tunnels leading into sunset's cul-de-sac. Where's purgatory now? We're eating our way home. Many of the poems I'm reading tonight are based on uh, music of some kind uh, or uh, a musician. This poem is based on a painter, Brock, the co-founder of Cubism with Picasso. Uh, he had an exhibition at the Walker Art Center, I think two years ago, maybe three. And this is based on some of his landscapes, Brock. He paints a field beside a road. A bicycle leans, black handlebars against a tree. Couples picnic behind that hill. They make love and later sleep. The plow, bicycle, are dead birds. The handles that angle the wind could drive men crazy by the sound of their flight. A skiff pulled up on the bank, turned over, left behind. No scolding, no chirping. It is September. The coordinates between stars have already been figured. Wings scissor emptiness, and the year abandons us the way a harp continually surrenders fingers. In one way or another, Everything I'm reading tonight has to do with death. And the next poem, I suppose, brings that home. It's called Letters to My Death. It's based on a musical precedent. Johann Jakob Froberger, who was a Baroque composer, had a, had a composition called Pieces for the Harpsichord. I don't know how to pronounce it in French, I'm sorry to say. And in that piece, he has a movement, a very small movement, called Meditations on My Death. And it's the sweetest sounding piece in the whole composition. And Baroque composers would often do that. Johann Sebastian Bach did it uh, quite frequently. When he would write about death, uh, it would just be wonderfully sweet. You would fall in love with that music. It, it would look at death so longingly. So this poem is called Letters to My Death. I've taken it off from Johann uh, Jakob Froberger. Death, you've been kind. When I asked for yellow chrysanthemums and they arrived like little suns, you stood alone in the corner holding your breath. Death, I whispered, you're blue in the face. Yes, you answered. I am cobalt. I am blue salt. If I ever loved you, it was your voice. Today I made a third grade girl cry in front of her class. Her quiet eyes watered like Venetian blinds. I didn't mean to. I just asked her to read, and the tears came. You were, as usual, serious as you stood in the doorway watching blackbirds flutter inside me. I felt like disappearing to wind up in Poland next to a blonde-haired relative in a wheat field, a thunderstorm on the horizon. The new buds fresh out of that woody foundry under the earth. You sit in a dark room in the farmhouse, going through old notebooks, crossing out lines you don't like. I dream of wild dogs and the sound of one hand your hand, moving slowly as if cropping a photograph. You wear a turban. Your name translated means it takes a year to get the joke. This next poem is also based on a musical precedent. 
Uh, it's after uh, Francois Couperin, a piece he has called The Apotheosis of Corelli. Corelli, Arcangelo Corelli, another Baroque composer. Couperin was a Baroque composer. Apotheosis means ascending into heaven. It's a Greek term. It means attaining godhood. Uh, and Corelli's mus or Couperin's music was a kind of a program music, so you could visualize Corelli ascending into heaven, taking his place among the angels and all the saints and everything. So this is called Apotheosis, and it's dedicated to Jim White, who uh, was a poet who died several years ago, but an excellent poet. And uh, he was a dancer, Jim White was, a ballet dancer before becoming a poet. 10 p.m., jazz on the radio, high lows singing, you're the tops, and the Virgin Mary waltzes down State Street in a 1923 flapper outfit. She stops before an unmarked door, knocks twice slow, then twice fast. Boxy Fords and Hupmobiles glide past like minor dancers in a ballet company. She throws a wink at you over her left shoulder as the door opens into the smoke and noise of the interior. I know it's hard to believe. You are standing by a tenement on the 2nd of May, a scratched version of Cakewalk and Mama by the Red Onion Jazz Babies comes through an open window. You do the natural thing. Cock your fedora at a steeper angle, cross the street, and wrap out the code on the door. It doesn't matter who the man with the cigar is. You're wearing tap shoes on the bare stage. From all the dim faces sitting at round tables, the spotlight picks you out, and your feet begin to move. Some music going through your head, something you remember from Diane's apartment. Miles, when he blew all night with train and bird, Mingus upstairs with a blonde part of the time. You're getting hot. Bank off the brick wall. Leap from table to table. They're clapping in rhythm. Even the bartender loses his fear of a raid and joins in, yells, your bones are hollow. You feel you could dance forever. There's always been music, always someone to dance it. Sparks shoot off your heels and toes, fast as machine guns, as typewriter keys, as a mad harpsichord solo in the fifth Brandenburg. And the audience is here, going wild in this moment, applauding, stamping their feet. Remember to smile. And the next piece is called Requiem Masses. Several years ago, we were supposed to think about the unthinkable and a nuclear war. And I started thinking about it and kind of went into a cataconic state. You know, there was nothing I could do. And eventually, I wrote this. It came out from it. And I think maybe, well, it ends with, with a line by Whitman from his uh, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. Uh, a section in there, a small section called Death Carol, which is kind of like a rhapsody to death. It's beautiful. So that's the last line of this poem. Requiem Masses. On a certain day, the statues of Lincoln and Jefferson, statues of Marx and Washington, stepped off their pedestals. On a certain day, the Christs climbed down from their crucifixes, and they headed out all of them, and others went, Plato, Socrates, Giordano Bruno, and the Davids, the one by Donatello and the one by Michelangelo, the Dantes, Chopins, the Polaskis, and Simon Bolivars. On a certain day, the Christ of the Andes stepped down and the busts of Schumann, Liszt, and the great Bach sitting atop student pianos stepped down and headed out. Pictures were suddenly empty. And on this day, the unsung and the resistance against the Nazis moved out, followed by Lorca, Confucius, and Shakespeare, all down a road without any dust. It was a day the recent and distant dead, for whom dying was not enough, walked away, led by Akhmatova, barefoot and wearing a white sheet. A dry season of wind 
that took down no names. And then Whitman, with shirt tails on fire, herding into the silence that last chant, sweet death, oh sweet death. So there were many, uh, many writers in there. Of course, Shakespeare, everyone knows. Akhmatova was a great Russian writer of the early 20th centuries. Um, the next piece is an elegy for a friend of mine who was killed in a car wreck in 1978. There were awful ice storms in Texas, and he lived in Texas then, and he was caught on the ice. Uh, he lived with us, with my wife and I, in St. Paul for a while, and he knew, you know, he knew the snow. He loved, you know, winter, things like that, and then he went down to Texas. Uh, but he had tried committing suicide before, so when I heard he had, he had been killed, I, I was angry at first. I thought, well, so he finally succeeded. And then I thought more about it and decided to write this. It's called The Green Man, Prelude and Fugue, and in it, I'm exploring how one speaks to the dead. Because I, I thought one doesn't speak to the dead with the language of the living anymore. They don't need it. Time and space are irrelevant to the dead. So in this piece, uh, there are some liberties taken with reality and some leaps in time as well. It's for uh, David Horn. The Green Man prelude and fugue. One more letter lies salted and abandoned in the drawer, where it waits like great chunks of ice piled on roofs in January, or signatures read in the mirror by monks of darkness. Rice paper boats sail into lagoons shaped like chest cavities. A man kneeling at water's edge stands and walks with his back to us, through blossoming sand plum. You always loved the winter. Days you would slide down the hill by our apartment on a broken cardboard box, the snow wet as ashes falling in Vietnam. It is winter now. I remain awake the wind blows stiffly all night. The back door is almost yanked off its hinges. The small Texas towns remain that were iced in last year. The newspaper is yellowing. It says the wife of the house survives. There were times last year I didn't want to talk. I wanted to sit by myself in a large room and gnaw my knuckles while thinking of the future. Now it is winter. The leaves are stuck inside the twigs, and there is no future. I want to bite the dust of April when the wind has its own chimes. I want to take the sun in my mouth like a hot wafer and clumsily stitch the head of a scarecrow disguised in wraparound sunglasses holding the steering wheel of a black Packard in one hand. I have made a postcard of the scene. There is a green fire snapping through corn. The scarecrow is to the left looking away from the windbreak across the field in a little house, Antonin Dvorak glances up as he pauses in a string quartet. Way off in the distance, crows appear as little dots against the severe and blue sky. There is
there's a foundry of men that works with the molten metal of women. It is too late to tell you this now, but I am the green man, the spring pig who has run away. Farmers' wives and the town carpenter ran after me. I fled to the deep woods. I could almost feel their hands and the spit being shoved through my rectum. In a previous lifetime, I failed the part of Hansel. I could not spell character properly. Stay with your father, he told me. I built fences and put in a road to the cottage. Barn cats went wild at milking time. When I arrived in America, I kissed the soil. Nobody wants to be like Robinson Crusoe and live by routine, become eccentric in a house full of cats and spent milk cartons. We want to live by our wits, sell off the Empire State Building to a desert prince. But there are so few answers. It's just as well. They get gunned down by some young question wanting to make a name for itself. Iran, Afghanistan, or your Chevrolet going out of control. I didn't want clocks to stop a few seconds before midnight in some cream-colored room in Clear Lake, Texas, where the wife of the house waits in her house coat all day looking across a wheat it would be easier if she didn't think you keep piling into a bridge railing on the ice of 78 on your way back from the lumber yard. The Christmas tree in the trunk twisted in the flame and geese passed over on their way north where I saw them later on the road to Fargo. I'll have forgotten how much like children they are, loud voiced, all giving directions at once. The Egyptian I didn't want you to have such a bird's eye view of the Arkansas River as your headlights scattered over the ice. I do not play Ich stehe mit einem Fuß im Graba on my flauto dolce. Though it is night again, and the moon with a lopsided face flies above the shadows of the backyard, the snow almost blue. Tell me the night doesn't sleep. Tell me there were nights you listened to your heart beating as you heard the traffic on roll to the window on the Covent Street. And when you spread out your bedding in the front room, you saw the picture of Anubis on the bookcase. I didn't know you carried the Book of the Dead with you. There are still days I cannot break the seams of my silence. But I always thought fire could be our friend, even now, as I light a cigarette, as I've so often done, and say, let the fire be good. Let the fire be good. Terry Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. Carrie's <laughs> a composer and an old friend of mine. Uh, and we have, on occasion, collaborated under the name Mother Child Poetry Jazz. Sometimes with large ensembles and sometimes just like this. But thank you. Uh, next, I would like to read a series of poems uh, from a work in progress. It's called the Judy Garland Poems. And 
I started writing these. It's a fluke, a total fluke. I got into ice hockey because I was at Edina Junior High last year with these people. <laughs> and it was last year, and I was teaching at the, at the junior high school, and it was during hockey tournament time. Edina High School was in the hockey tournament. They won the state tournament that year. And I watched on TV in the lounge the hockey tournament. And it was exciting. And so I got into hockey. And, and so when the North Stars made the finals, that's our local hockey team, everyone knows, uh, we decided to get Spectrum pay TV to watch the home games. After the North Stars went down in four, in four games, we were stuck with Spectrum for the next month. <laughs> and on occasion I watched, and one of the things I watched was a rerun of a Judy Garland TV special shot in 1963 with Mickey Rooney. And I watched, I, I guess I was amazed. I had no idea that, you know, she seemed that far gone then. You know, she stumbled, she, she dropped the endings of her words in her songs. And um, it seemed to me that, you know, even though I was, I was a teenager at the time in 1963, you know, I, I should have noticed something was wrong, but I didn't. And, all the, and I thought, maybe no one else did either. So it started me writing, well, I wrote a poem on it. It was a page and a half. I took it to my writer's group. And they, you know, dutifully, as a writer's group should, tore it apart, told me I, <laughs> I needed uh, to do more work on it. I needed to do some research. And so I did. And I read books, and I talked to people to get their impressions of Judy Garland and some of their stories. And they've been marvelous. And it started growing. It was seven pages at one point, and then it was too much, so I cut it down to three, and then it started growing again. And it's out of my control. It's a monster. <laughs> I can't stop myself. So these are 11 of the Judy Garland poems. And there are more, but I'm not going to read them all to you. And it's from a work in progress. As, as I was working on it and revising the poem, it occurred to me that it that it should actually be a number of distinct poems. Running through these poems are a number of themes. One of the themes has to deal with airplanes. Uh, I'm using my memories of my aviation career here. Uh, the airplane that is mentioned is known under several names. One is a C-47, that's its military designation as a cargo plane. One is a DC-3, that's a civilian passenger plane that the airplanes used. The other is uh, what the pilots call them, that was a Goonie Bird. But it's the same plane. Uh, Northwest Airlines started out with, C with uh, DC-3s when they, when they got into it. And uh, North Central was using DC-3s up to just a few years ago, I think, when they decided to merge with with whoever it was they merged with, and they finally got jets. There are no titles to the poems yet. They're just numbered, known as the Judy Garland poems. I can't say she'll ever come back. One lion and scarecrow are too much already. The munchkins so drunk and crazy, police chase them through the hotel with butterfly nets. And that voice as if she came from a planet of trout lilies and great blues singers, where each one has a chair and a cup. There are huge dining halls beside the river that brings her to this world. To sing to a whole generation when light was held inside khaki C-47s carrying wounded back from Burma, and sang past them until just an audience kept her alive. She must love them all and sit on the edge of the stage like a stone that started skipping over water and remained and cracked the silence as one opens a window and the people all breathe in unison with her. C-47s. 
second one is dedicated to a friend of mine, Eileen Shapiro. But the you in here is Judy Garland. At five years old in L.A., you want to be home with your father in your own bed instead of singing and dancing before the curtain goes up in movie houses every night. You're still called baby gum. Your mother says you think too much about yourself and packs her bags. She's sure you don't love her or want her around. There's not an ounce of gratitude in your little body. She steps into the hallway and locks you inside. You haven't been taught to use the phone on purpose. Her steps go away into forever. Your mother knows the exact interval of silence after crying stops before opening the door to give you a glimpse into reprieve, forgiveness that overshadows the cruelty of forgiveness. The third one. All she was ever supposed to do was be fat like other blues singers, take a tune and lay it down tight and mean for a generation sucked into that war. My father flew it, ferry pilot on a C-47, Cairo, Kabul, Karachi, supplies over, wounded back. When they cross into the States, he gets on the intercom and the boys in the back break into tears. But if it's 1939, Louis B. Meyer gives her pills to keep her thin like the tunnel to a gold mine so people will come to the movies and love her. There's always a movie and Nembutal to put her out between takes. The other pill wakes her up when they need her on the set. When she finishes Love Finds Andy Hardy, she knows she'll never have Andy or Mickey Rooney, so she will be like a sister to him, stand by smiling like the Grand Canyon as Judge Hardy marvels. Heaven knows what this generation has coming to it. She knows the generation will paint the woodwork in houses that old Studebaker green, will follow orders into the teeth of Europe and Asia. For days or months, the sky rains blood. Those who make it home return just in time to give birth to us baby boomers and repay a small portion of their debt to the dead. They will never be totally successful, and she knows that too, as the judge stands with the message that came over the short wave. The crisis is over for his wife's mother. The world is beautiful after all. There is a Santa Claus. There are references in these poems to some of the movies that, that she made. The fourth one. Maybe Andy survives the war and rides home in the belly of a goonie bird. At 12,000 feet, the world curves in slow motion. There are survivors because there is no way the sky can hold all the dead, let alone Earth. Maybe he meets his old law professor outside a lunch counter in May. In another month, he's sharing a legal secretary with an older lawyer. By the time the 60s hit, he's into gin and dry vermouth. His sons pass through high school, listening to music he doesn't understand. He argues with them on the patio. Summer, glasses sweat near the front bushes. Ice cubes melt in tune to the green dusk things that disappear like suns. They drift for the sake of an education and keep drifting for the sake of a different water or embarrassment. Some centrifugal force flings them to the corners of the continent. Why the hell fight a war in the first place? They argue about politics, race, the weather, until logic, blunt weapon, gives way to night. The fifth one. Judy and my mother held hands through my childhood, led me and my brothers through the brigades of tricksters, bozo triumphant, il magnifico, 
bozo agonistas and bozo perdu. We were taught there would be witches and magic monkeys, and each of us has one chance to defeat them, but we're not told what it is. We needed you to help us against the years themselves that back away from Hiroshima, but you couldn't even make it clear to Nixon's resignation. No one blames you. We're amazed you made it as far as you did with death dismantling you. Death, like a lover who says, honey, you know I always wanted you. Death takes your, <clears throat> death takes your voice, the syllables you drop at the ends of words, the two keys that are all you can sing in anymore. You keep on singing, slow and sad, the audience and you both in tears. Death is your greatest fan. The sixth. I've spent the summer on the upstairs porch. Most of the time the sun is sinking behind the trees like a frigate with its bills of lading. Once at night something moved too fast to be a star. It was that silverized balloon they sent up to study radar. We used to see it on the road halfway between Indiana and Texas when it appeared unexpectedly like a truck stop. Outside, crickets are learning Morse code. We gave my father to a war, my brothers and I, my mother. You were supposed to make sure men didn't leave parts of themselves behind so they wouldn't keep going to war to find themselves again and again. Your job, like Mission Impossible, when history was just a nightmare and Hitler stood with his mustache in front of adoring crowds at night, screaming, a thousand years, the rule of death. And President Roosevelt picked you out, a girl, still a virgin, to save the world, though you came here promising nothing. The next one has a note to it, has a DC-3 shooting instrument approaches, and that means that it's practicing simulated instrument landings. The pilot normally wears, a, wears what they call a hood, which is a device that sits on top of the head and uh, is plastic and it comes down like this so it, he can't see, or, the pilot, or she can't see outside the airplane, he can just see the instruments. As I write, night hawks. Shrill cries, nervous fluttering of wings. They float, they whoosh down on, I'm tempted to say night, with the metallic sound of someone being yanked out of a body. A DC-3 shoots instrument approaches at the international airport, comes in from the east, passes the outer marker, gear down, there must be visual contact by the inner marker with those strobes synchronized into a ball of light, as if light can be more synchronized than it is. Rolling toward the threshold of the runway, the earth, life, moment we can stop holding our breaths. And then full power, pull the nose up, go around, enter the pattern again. It is, in the same way that getting used to your death is, Routine, democratic, in a plane that rolled out of the factory when Wizard of Oz first hit the screens. You walk uphill to the cockpit and can't hear your footsteps through the soundproofing. Uh, MGM Studios got Judy hooked on uh, various kinds of drugs. They were, they were diet drugs, first of all, but really they were amphetamines, and, uh, and she remained addicted to them throughout her life for 30-some years. She was taking these pills and couldn't sleep, or if she could sleep, would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, feeling incredibly lonely, so she would call people on the telephone, and it became famous, these 3 a.m. calls. Suddenly it is 3 a.m. The silence is full of holes and quicksand. 
No one should make a career of loneliness. It's just one of those things that seeps out of your heart into a finger in the telephone dial and through the whip snake of wire. You call your friends, your daughter's friends. If that is not enough, then friends of friends of friends. Sometimes, through no fault of yours, you dial the future. I shouldn't be surprised when my turn comes up. Why interpret the noise at the other end as silence just because we live in different time zones and cannot hear the years come flying at us? On TV, they do a rerun of the special you shoot with Mickey Rooney in 1963. Your legs are too thin. They're in danger of breaking. Everyone thinks you're drunk, but that's OK. It's the last year of Kennedy. The comedian Jerry Van Dyke, wising off by the fence they use in Hee Haw, looks drunk too. It's too late to fire up a romance with Mickey. The pictures left him behind and wives as if he was an expired parking meter. You sat on that stage as if you could have a life with a man you love. In reality, objects keep drifting in and out of focus. Exhaustion is taking your measurements, steps on your heels to make you appear unsteady. Nobody knows why you can make it to the end of each song, how you can joke about the raw deals MGM gave you. The TV executives must think it's interesting to show, if not exactly the death of a star, at least the wreck of one. They pay a lot of money to see if this time you'll collapse on stage. But you keep disappointing them. Your heart doesn't even break for good. This is how it ends. You don't need lawyers anymore to tell you life is OK. Don't need jockeys, sound and tech men, the husbands your mother kept throwing at you. A few pills, all you had when they took your sleep away. It's hard to get the right dose. In the middle of the night, nothing works anyway. The bathroom door is locked behind you. You have to lean against the wall. You are sitting down and look small, arms, legs wrapped against your body. It ends at night because it is supposed to. You didn't ask anyone, and you were probably just thinking, sleep, sleep, like Marilyn in that room of the near dressers and the telephone off the hook. No one to give you permission one way or the other. Louis B. Meyer was already dead, and Mother Gum, a name that rhymes with dumb and glum. Garland was a critic in a Chicago audience. You were sick of being called baby, and Judy sounded good. And the last one. One night I dream I leave the back door wide open and all the kitchen lights on. It is still warm enough for a scream. You step in as if 1969 never existed. Sit on the rocker by the bed watching over me. It is too late for lullabies. We were supposed to be good for each other. I don't mean you were to be treated like Elvis, but we, Kennedy's children, needed you. All that's left now is to buy pieces of cut glass and hang them in our windows, or watch light going violet to indigo through a glass coffee cup on the arm of the sofa. You sit confidently in the rocker, making no noise. It's, how, it's hard to say how long you are there before you begin to fade away. Is this your new job or some kind of freelance thing, a way to deal with the night creeping around the Earth as the space shuttle destroys our notions of what speed is like? Around the Earth that is still here, something to be thankful for. You must have been successful after all. Thank you. Thank you. So that's my reading. If there are any questions, I'd be 
happy to answer them or talk about things. You're still writing these down? Right? Oh yeah, I still am. They're still coming out, and I'm, I'm still revising. The marvelous thing about revising, some of these things that I've worked on over 30 times, but uh, the marvelous thing about it is that as I revise poems, sometimes they seem totally impossible to come out right. Uh, new poems start happening. And uh, I never realized that a longish work in progress could do that can be self-generating. But it's become that, at least for the time being, and I'm having a lot of fun with it at the moment. A as much fun as I can have, I mean, <laughs> with a heavy subject like that. How did I get started in poetry? It was a fluke, like most things in my life, I think. I uh, used to hate poetry when I was in grade school and most of high school. I loved to read, though, and I read novels. I read Conrad. That was a fluke. Joseph Conrad. I, I read a great deal of Conrad by the time I was a sophomore in high school. And I, I still think Conrad's one of the greatest writers of the 20th century in English. And uh, so through an accident, because Conrad was Polish and my parents had a book called The Conrad Argosy in the house that I used to read when I was sick uh, from school, I knew what good writing was. And, and I hated the kind of tripe they gave us for poetry in grade school. Things like Trees by Joyce Kilmer which I still hate, and I get into trouble for that sometimes. <laughs> but uh, sometimes people say, you know, poetry, ah, oh, that's right, girls like it. And that's the kind of stuff they're thinking about, is Trees by Joyce Kilmer. But I hated it. And, uh, it's a great girl, that is. Oh, yeah, I know. I like reading. Good. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I did love to read. I did a great deal of reading. And I thought, when I was about a junior or senior, that maybe I, I wasn't giving poetry a fair break. And so I started reading some on my own. And uh, so I started, I read Frost and, and some others. And you know, I thought they were pretty good. was able to get over the, the hump, I guess, of, of realizing that poetry doesn't have to rhyme or have a strict meter. And then I read uh, Eliot's Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which nobody's supposed to like. <laughs> but I did. I didn't understand it, but I knew it was well written. And that's, that's how I got hooked into Prufrock. And, you know, it is an extremely well written piece. And particularly in that uh, second stanza where it goes, uh, the yellow smog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes. I can't remember it exactly, but it's lingered in pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And uh, I was hooked, you know, <laughs> after that. You know, I think it's still good, you know, it's a bit overwritten, you know. <laughs> But it, it is still good. Uh, so I read that poem. I didn't understand it. And so I read it and read it and read it. And I think about 20 times through it hit me that this was a poem about me, 17 years old, alienated teenager. And it was powerful. It was a powerful experience and changed my life. And I realized, you know, if poetry can do something like that, I had indeed been misjudging it. But that, you know, this was poetry that it did have a real power to it. And it wasn't uh, the kind of doggerel that we were, you know, spoon-fed or force-fed or intravenously fed, you know. <laughs> uh, so then I was hooked, and I started writing, you know, 10th-rate Eliot imitations, you know, which are truly awful. And, uh, but I had to write from that point on. And started learning and trying to teach myself. And, and here I am, 20 years later. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I was curious uh, whether you like the Polish poet uh, Miwa or the Roman writer. Yeah, the question is, do I like the...
Polish poet Szeszłow Miłosz. Yeah, I do. He's very difficult, I, I find. Do you read Polish? No, I don't read Polish, unfortunately, because there are some fantastic Polish poets uh, whom I have to read in translation. Uh, but Miłosz is one of a number of poets of that generation. Among others are uh, Zbigniew Herbert, Tadeusz Rosevich, uh, a guy named Harasimovic. Uh, there are just tons of them. And, and they're brilliant. They're, they truly are. Uh, a marvelous woman poet named Wisława Simborska is fantastic. And their sense of irony is, is supreme. They all remained back in Poland, though. And I'm sure, you know, don't hold it against Miłosz that he emigrated. Uh, you know, one has to do, you have to do what you have to do. Uh, among his things that I like best, only because I can understand them best, I think, uh, are the long poems in a book called Bells in Winter. Uh, and those, they, they are beautiful, beautiful poems. Uh, I have with me, though, a, a book by his uncle. <laughs> and it's called 14 Poems by O.V. D.L. Miłosz, translated by Kenneth Rexroth. And these are beautiful, I'll tell you. They're fantastic poems. Let me show you one. I just read it tonight. God. <laughs> Here I am. It's supposed to be my reading, right? But especially tomorrow mustn't find out where I am. The woods, the woods are full of blackberries. Your voice is like the sound of the moon in an old ink well where the echo, the echo of June comes to drink. And nobody must pronounce my name down there in dream. The times, the times are well fulfilled. Your whiteness in its simple dress is like a tree suffering too young for its first sap. And the briars must close behind us, for I am afraid, I am afraid to go back. The great white flowers caress your sweet knees. The shadow, the shadow is pale with love. You mustn't tell the water of the forest who I am. My name, my name is utterly dead. Your eyes are the happy color of young showers, of young showers on a drowsy lagoon. Don't say anything to the wind of the old cemetery. It could order me to follow it. Your hair is like the summer, the moon, and the earth. We must live, live, nothing but live. <sighs> so, hmm? yeah, this is, this is, this is correct. <laughs> Well, I, I think they're uh, more in touch than presidents of the United States. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I do believe that they're part of the human family. Uh, some, sometimes I, I don't understand exactly where he's coming from. I, I know that he has difficulties with American poets. Uh, mainly because American poets haven't lived through the kind of hell that he did. Um, you know, and he mentions in those lectures, and this is the, the Harvard lecture, lectures, uh, The Witness of Poetry, which I think is a fine book. But uh, he mentions in there that, that the poets did become the voice of the people. And in Poland, there's that curious phenomenon uh, where Poland didn't exist for 200 years, well over 200 years, uh, the poets did become responsible for the culture. You know, Polish culture survived, and that was because of its writers. And the writers did it through amazing feats of virtuosity, bringing irony to, to a sublime state. And now, you know, many, many writers in Eastern Europe are, are using irony heavenly. Uh, you know, Milan Kundera, the, the Czech writer, for example, and others as well. Uh, you know, going back and, and using myth, for example. Uh, during World War, War II, 
the poets, you know, were, you know, very much the, the voice of the people. Uh, there was a clandestine radio station set up during the Warsaw Uprising of 1944, uh, and they had to beam uh, a shortwave transmission to London, and then the rest of Poland could pick it up on their BBC receivers. But they had poets, okay, reading this transmission to London, and it was later replayed. So this is, you know, the central part that poetry played in Polish life, at least during the war. But you know, a book goes on sale in Poland, and it's it's gone in a day. You know, you know, you, you'd think that Star Wars was playing at a theater, the lines going around the block, but it's just a book of poetry. In America, of course, there's there's not exactly that. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, I think in Western culture, uh, and I guess America, you know, the poets have some poets. I'm not saying all poets. That's dangerous to generalize. Some poets have you know, gone off the deep end or turned their backs on, on the audience, mainly because there hasn't been an audience. And uh, I don't know. I, I'd like to see it come back. I think it is, in some ways. I see hopeful signs in Minnesota and around the country. But maybe they will. I think, I think they are, you know, though there, there are poets in touch. I hope. Okay. How did we collaborate our piece? Well, we've been we've been doing this since uh, 1966, 1976, and uh, started out mostly by trial and error uh, with a number of pieces, trying to see what worked, doing a lot of experimenting. Uh, carries a composer as well, a uh, you know, wonderful composer, and gathers groups around, you know, <laughs> groups of musicians, and they, and they play his compositions. But uh, I, I've, I've always been interested in jazz and never knew enough about it, and still don't, you know. But the more I get to know about it, the, the more I love it. And, and I met Carrie in a, in a school setting. We were both teaching for the Minneapolis Public Schools in an arts program at one time. Uh, and I, I think Carrie was thinking about poetry the same way I was thinking about music. I always wanted to collaborate with a musician. And so we started practicing. And uh, then this poem came out, and Carrie composed that that haunting, wonderful music to go along with it. So whenever I read that piece now, you know, even if Carrie isn't accompanying me, the music is going through my head. Unfortunately, the audience can't hear it. <laughs> we hope to uh, have, have a concert of, of more collaboration uh, later next year uh, at the Bakken where we can have a regular acoustic piano. questions? Well, you've been a great audience. You're welcome. Thank you, John. Thank all of you. That's right. Next week, here at Elatra and Nancy Ortonstone. Old friends of mine. Good, good writers.